Well, my name is, uh, my maiden name is Mary Cyberling. Uh, my last name is Hume now. Uh, and I am Henrietta Cyberling's uh, second child. And I have a younger sister. I wish she could be here. Uh, so that is my relation. And of course, I was in Akron. Uh, we were living in the gatehouse at a time when there was a lot of ferment about a lot of things, but there always seems to be ferment about something or other. At this time, <clears throat> there was certain ferment in our family, but had been as almost as long as I can remember, because there were, mother was in a state of mind where she was amazingly uh, able to carry on despite all the conflict and problems that were going on between her, my father and her, and, and my father, the Cyberling family, who were not totally helpful to her. So she was always kind of looking for a way to live, uh, be more successful in handling these and be able to do everything she could to make life better for everybody that she could. And uh, <clears throat> so that's when this event of the Oxford Group happened. And the Oxford Group was brought to Akron by Harvey Firestone, who's, um, I think his oldest son, Bud, they called him, was, uh, I don't know whether he was really an alcoholic or whether he was just, you know, kind of a drunk. And so he hoped that the Oxford group, which had received quite a lot of uh, attention, was coming to Akron. So mother, who was always uh, looking for new ways to do things, ways, you know, solutions for things, I mean, amazingly so, uh, she thought, well, I'll just go and see what they're all about. Because she did come from sort of a religious background. I think grandmother was probably a Presbyterian, although we hardly ever went to church or anything like that. But she knew a lot about uh, religion and, you know, thought highly of it. So uh, mother decided to go to the Oxford Group meeting, which was being held in the hope that it will have help uh, Bud Firestone. And she took my uh, brother, who was two years older than I, and he was just at the age uh, when um, he could, when it really was very important to him. I mean, he really absorbed it uh, much more deeply as a sort of a guide in life than I did. I heard about it and I thought it was interesting and, I, and my sister was the same way. But uh, I remember when John came back from that meeting, he said, this is typical of John, he said, well, he said, I got to go to the Oxford Group meeting and you didn't sort of thing. <laughs> I mean, you know, it made me sort of think of the way maybe Bill Wilson might have acted. But anyway, so <clears throat> um, this was, mother was very impressed by it. And so she came back, told us all about it, how they had uh, quiet times, which are like my meditation periods. And they believed deeply in uh, absolute honesty, absolute purity, absolute, uh, I forget, love and absolute one other, I can't remember all the absolutes, but you know, you can sort of get, guess what they would be. To her, all, all through her, uh, my adult or, or you know, teenage on life, a mother would get ideas in the middle of the night. Sometimes she would get an idea in which she apologized to us for something she had said, you know, and, and she was always trying to get help from something in, in some message that would come to her. And uh, <clears throat> so she relied upon this guidance for th various things. So, and then they have the quiet times of meditation and so forth. So <clears throat> uh, the Oxford group was very successful. Many <clears throat> people came to it, including my grandmother, <clears throat> Mrs. F.A. Cyberling. And uh, they had a big meeting up at Stan Hewitt where they, she lived and um, Many people, prominent people in Akron came and it was considered to be a very successful thing, although I must say Bud Firestone did not stop drinking. But anyway, <clears throat> the Oxford Group then, in my opinion, and a lot of other people's, uh, made the, I think, the big mistake of trying to get prominent, wealthy people to become members. They weren't the fishermen that jo Jesus chose. They were the you know, successful people who had their problems and needed help too. But uh, mother didn't feel that this was 
these kinds of meetings were helpful to her. And there were others, a small number of people in those first meetings to whom she gravitated uh, because they were not uh, prominent. They were, you know, successful in their own way, but uh, they were not uh, of the sort that the Oxford group wanted to get because they liked to have, wanted to have house parties where they would uh, invite, wealthy people would make their uh, estates open to them and so they would get more prominence that way. So anyway, mother began to, <clears throat> she felt the value of uh, meetings with people and I think people often quote the Bible where it said uh, uh, something about how one should speak to one another about one's uh, problems and, and this was sharing, of course. So <clears throat> this small group of people began to meet regularly. It was kind of like a prayer group. And uh, <clears throat> she, she was very, um, recognized the help and it kind of, this whole business of returning to uh, uh, first Christianity and trying to practice these particular uh, ways of life uh, really, I think, changed her whole attitude toward so many things. She became more understanding of why her in-laws were uh, kind of accepting dad's uh, interpretation of events as opposed to her and sort of blaming her for things that didn't work out. And uh, so she began to think of a grandmother <clears throat> and how it must feel to have a son who is not being uh, successful and, and, not, and having a lot of problems that are of his own making. And, uh, and she thought about how she had been angry with my grandfather who uh, <clears throat> did not act in their best interest, she thought, and she would actually this was part of the Oxford group teaching. She, you know, making amends and ma uh, mending fences and so forth. So she actually went and confronted my grandfather and said, you know, I'm sorry if I was very critical and, you know, and, and it totally softened him up, you see. That was the wonderful thing. He'd say, well, Henrietta, I know, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, <clears throat> and just the attitude toward grandmother was much better. And by this time, my father had moved out, uh, which was, <clears throat> I remember I was 12 when that happened. <clears throat> and when all this happened, I was uh, about 15. And um, it was a big relief to us when my father moved out. But of course, he just moved up to my grandparents' house so we could see him whenever we wanted or he could take us to things like a ball game or something like that. So it wasn't as though we were, had lost our father, uh, but we had just lost the arguments and the, you know, the struggles and all. Of course, Granady Cybering said he would help us buy a house, and, and they thought about the different houses in that area, and the more Mother thought about it, the more she realized that we would be better off still living at Stan Hewitt. And this house, the gate lodge, had actually been built for the gardener. And so mother thought, you know, I'd rather live in that little house uh, and still live on this property than uh, move to some place. And I'm so glad she made that decision. So <clears throat> anyway, she right away began to think of things in a different light and she would tell us experiences that she had had. And I must admit, uh, I think mother, because she was uh, the only child of these uh, two wonderful people in El Paso, Texas, where she had grown up, and they were uh, very, uh, you know, uh, aware, intelligent people who wanted to live their best and, and do the best for her and so forth. and. And the very fact that grandmother and granddaddy uh, <coughs> sent her to Vassar, uh, which was a lot of people, her friends, grandmother Buckler's friends would say, how can you be doing that, Mary? Mary Maddox was her name. How can you do that? You're going to make a blue stocking of her. Yeah. I think it would be pretty hard to make a blue stocking of mother when I think about it. 
But anyway, so the very fact that they did that, that they were uh, onlooking, and my grandfather was very judge-like. You know, he, had, he was a very rational, uh, sensible person and, and very, uh, had a wonderful sense of humor such as only judges can have, you know. So anyway, uh, because of the fact that they were like this and uh, they put all this uh, effort into mother, um, she was inclined to, and I, I know when you're at a certain age, you're inclined to feel, feel sort of entitled, you know. You're, uh, you've accomplished a lot, you're a wonderful pianist. Uh, she had lovely clothes. They sent some time, after she graduated from Vassar, she spent some time living in New York because grandmother had a lot of friends there. And, um, and so you get to feeling that you're sort of entitled. And then to get in this family, which she thought was gonna be a wonderful future for her because there were all these, she'd never had brothers and sisters and she thought this would be a wonderful uh, life for her. Uh, then to have all this dissension and, and dad not really behaving the way he should. And um, it was a, sort of a terrible shock. It was a shock to my grandparents because they thought that this would be the best thing for mother. So uh, this was the, the, the way, but mother still felt, uh, you know, as, she, as though she had, had should, sh she should have been recognized for what she brought to the family and what she stood for. And instead of that, she was sort of scorned and, and sometimes when they had big family dinners, uh, we would, uh, or some, some celebration, we would say, we're not going to go, you know, because we knew how mother was being, uh, their attitude toward her. And uh, she would say, oh no, you must go, they're your family and, uh, and you're a part of them, so you just, you must go. So that, that was the kind of situation that prevailed. Well, she told me after she had been in the Oxford group for a while, and also another thing, uh, she didn't have a car. So when she had to go someplace, she either had to take the bus or she had to uh, get a, a ride from the chauffeur, my grandparents' chauffeur, which they would be glad to offer, but you know, it was kind of demeaning. And so she talked about how she was getting on the bus one day and uh, she saw sitting in one of the seats a large woman, uh, not too well dressed, who looked sort of tired and she looked as though she was pregnant. And uh, mother thought in the past, she would have looked at that woman, she would have thought, felt sort of scornful. Instead of that, she said, my heart went out to her. And, and you know, that shows how this new, rebirth of religion, really the true Christian religion, or I mean Jesus' religion, had affected her. So this was the state of mind that she was in, and this uh, little prayer group that she was attending all the time, regularly, what meant so much to her. And they would share their problems. In this group was um, Bob Smith, who was an uh, anal surgeon, and uh, he, everyone in the group knew that he was a problem drinker, that he was what they call a silent drinker. He just drank by himself. He didn't uh, think anyone knew about it, or he hoped they didn't. And he certainly didn't think anyone in the group knew about it. And so this bothered mother terribly because she thought, we've got to find a way to help Bob, you know. So her next problem was, how can we get him to admit it? And she thought about it and she decided uh, that the only way to get him to admit it would be if we all admitted some of our problems. So she talked this over with the other members of the group and uh, they all agreed that they would have this one meeting where they would all share deeply. And so when it came turn to mother's turn to say something, she, uh, I said to her later when she told me about this, I said, well, mother, what did you share? <laughs> and she said, well, she said, I just told them something about the difficulties in my marriage. But she said, I told them things that, I told them, I've never told anyone in this group about these problems I've had before. And it's very hard for me to tell you, and I just hope you will pray for me. 
And they all did that. And then Bob, I, I sort of see a big drama here. Then Bob stood up and he said, well, he said, I have want to tell you something, share something with you that I haven't sh really shared with you before. But he said, I have a terrible problem. I am a silent drinker. And he said, it may cost me my practice to tell you this. But he said, I don't know why I do it. I don't like the stuff. I don't like the taste. And yet I just can't stop. And he said, I want you to pray for me. Well, so uh, they said, well, we certainly will pray for you. And so mother, of course, thought about it a lot. And she thought, she'd tell Bob about this. She'd say, uh, what about just slowly tapering off? And he said, oh, Henrietta, Henny, as he called her. Uh, I've tried that, believe me, and it, it doesn't work. And then she got guidance in the middle of the night. Uh, she got guidance that Bob must quit cold turkey. And so she, this time she, she felt it was guidance. It, in fact, often her guidance she felt was like a voice telling her this. And she said, Bob, I had guidance for you last night, and it said to me, Bob must quit drinking cold turkey. And he said, oh, honey, I couldn't do that. He said, I just couldn't do it because I get to a point where I can't not take a drink, you know. And anyone who is an alcoholic or a drinker knows that this is the truth. And he said, that's why I need to have you pray for me, because I don't know how to quit. I can't quit toker. She said, well, we will pray for you, and, and if we get guidance, we'll tell you. So it was in this atmosphere <clears throat> that Bill Wilson in New York, who had had similar terrible drinking problems, and he had, uh, in this wonderful book that I brought along, he uh, had many wonderful people that he met. Uh, one of the most famous one was uh, a Dr. Silkworth, uh, who had a, a hospital that would help people uh, with different problems of this sort. And he had, of course, a lot of alcoholics. And he had a mission, which he called the Calvary Mission. This was uh, Sam Schumacher. And these people uh, helped uh, Bill uh, quit the drinking. And also, uh, they gave him good advice. But before I tell you any of this, and I didn't, I didn't, I must admit, I didn't know this, and Mother didn't know it either. If she did, she never told me. Uh, Bill uh, once had a terrific, what uh, Carl Jung, and he was very familiar with Carl Jung, uh, describes as a psychic uh, experience. And it, it almost, it makes you think when you read about it, and, and it's just fascinating to read, it's, it's like Paul in Damascus, and it's like Martin Luther getting this blinding uh, message when he was right in the middle of the dark forest returning from the corruption of the uh, Vatican and all that, those people, that he, and think he was thinking about uh, how none of those people down there are following the, uh, what the Bible says. And he got this message, you must translate the Bible into language that the people can read. And it was the same experience, you know, the blinding light and everything, and just taken over by this. And that's the first thing he did when he got back to his little uh, uh, monastery or whatever it was. So uh, that's what, so Bill had that experience, and that's what helped him uh, quit. And of course, he had the advice of Silkworth, who knew so much about this, and he, they also knew Sam Schumacher. And <coughs> so <coughs> Bill was, because of his drinking, he had lost the opportunity to recoup this uh, business that he was in, uh, this brokerage business. And so he was looking for this now that he had stopped drinking and was uh, fit to participate in such a thing. Uh, he and a lot of his friends uh, wanted, had, had read about something that was going on in Akron, Ohio in connection with uh, a, a company that made uh, 
machinery related to the rubber industry. And uh, I didn't, must admit, I didn't know all of this while I was growing up, but I knew that he was there for some business purpose. And I knew that whatever he was there for, thanks a lot, Nils Foreman, uh, fell through. And so there he was, a stranger in a strange land, so to speak, uh, at the Mayflower Hotel, all of his people who had come with him to work on this project had left. He was at times uh, prone to depression, and he was about as depressed as you could be. And uh, so he went out of his hotel in the early evening and uh, passed by the bar, and he heard all these people uh, you know, jingling the ice in their glasses and so forth, and he had a, felt this ter terrific urge to go in there and get a drink. And he realized that this, he was on the edge of the precipice. Uh, Norman, the name will come to me after this is all over, uh, gave him a list of people that he could call that were connected with the Oxford group. So, <clears throat> He looked over this list and he came across the name uh, Henrietta Cyberling. And he knew all about Cyberling and Goodyear and all that sort of thing. He knew that they were very wealthy and he thought, oh, I, I just couldn't possibly call a, a someone, a, a Cyberling family uh, out of the blue. But he said, I, I felt I had to do it, you know, because he was, uh, oh, at the precipice. So he did. And of course, the, the Henrietta Cyberling that he called was not exactly, uh, you know, the bosom buddy of Mrs. F.A. Cyberling. And so he called her, and this is the thing that I think is so wonderful, because when Mother told us afterwards of what he said, it has never uh, left our minds. My sister said the same thing that it was the most memorable thing that he called up and said, I'm a rum hound from New York and I have to talk to someone. Those are exactly what he said. And people sometimes add other things that he said, I want to talk to someone from the Oxford group or something like that, but that isn't what he said. He said, I'm a rum hound from New York and I've got to talk to someone. And I think that if mother had not been in this kind of a, a change in her outlook on life, she would not have been as open to him. My grandmother also was in the Oxford group, by the way. Uh, but of course, she, as soon as he said that, immediately Bob came into her mind. And she said, well, come right on out. This was in the evening, of course. And um, so he, he did come out and uh, and had a talk, and mother, uh, he told mother some of what he had been through and so forth, and, and right away she said, you know, you've got to talk to my friend Bob Smith, who uh, it was in the Ox is in the Oxford group, or was, and he is just what you need. Had, you know, this, this was a godsend. So she called up uh, Anne and uh, told her that this person was coming, and that, I mean, would, would come and wants to meet Bob. And she said, well, I think, I can't, don't know whether that she called Anne at night, might be, or whether she called her the next morning. But Bob had been on a binge, and he was, you know, the way one is after a binge. And it was Mother's Day. So to sort of make up for it, he had brought Anne a great, wonderful plant and everything. And uh, so, Anne told Bob, uh, Henrietta wants you to meet someone who, who came to her house yes, yesterday and because she is sure that he will be able to help you. And Bob was very resistant. He said, oh, no one can help me kind of thing. And uh, Anne said, uh, Henrietta wants us to come and we, you must go. That's it. So he said, well, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go. I won't stay long, but I'll go. So he shows up 
uh, that morning, uh, Mo Mother's Day, and um, they they go and and are introduced, and then they sit in this little room, which was we called the library, but that's just because it had one big wall of books and a, a desk and a chest of drawers and a chair sort of like this. So you, they call it a king's chair. I don't know what it is. Uh, and they sat together in this little room and talked for hours. And of course, mother served them lunch. And uh, then I think they stayed for dinner. And they couldn't stop talking. And then Bob agreed, okay, I'll, I'll see, see how, you know, I'll go along with it. I don't know what he said, but he was impressed. And uh, so that was, uh, Bob uh, did go to the hospital and get uh, cleaned up, as they call it. I think of better ways of getting cleaned up than that, but he had to go through it. And then after that, they realized, and uh, meanwhile, uh, <coughs> Bill had already had an experience with helping uh, drunks overcome their alcoholism. And so he knew it could be done, and that the thing, the key to it was talking with them. And Silkworth had once said, you know, Bill, you turn people away when you talk as though you're preaching to them. You have to just talk with them about what alcoholism, because Silkworth was the one who realized it was m built on an allergy of some sort. And he said, you've got to talk with them what alcoholism is and, and that there are ways to get over it and they don't have to go on like this. So um, Bill had this idea that way, way back then, he had the idea that his way of talking to these people was so effective that he said, he could kill all the alcoholics in the world, you know. He, he had always had sort of a messianic <laughs> uh, impulse there, you know. Whereas Silkworth uh, disabused him of that thought. So anyway, um, then they began to realize that it, it was important to use what you had uh, been able to achieve, uh, great he hurt and everything, um, to use it to help others, and so they managed to, talking through different uh, churches and also the judge and so forth, uh, they learned about different alcoholics who needed help, and they started out um, helping these people and having meetings with them and everything else, and that, of course, is what became Alcoholics Anonymous, in effect. Anyone who came to our house, you know, company and so forth, the, the way the gatehouse was constructed, there was this not very large but very attractive living room with a fireplace in one end and a grand pan, I mean baby grand on this side, a couch here, and, uh, and then right next to it was the dining room, which was also not very large, but she had uh, portieres across se se separating the living room from the dining room, <coughs> dining room. <coughs> and very often, and mother knew we were there, we, my sister and I especially, would stand behind those portieres and stare at the guests and listen to everything they had to say, because it was kind of an adventure, you know. <coughs> so when we knew that Bill was coming, uh, and mother was loved to talk to us about things, she'd say, you know, who the p person was was coming, and what he said and everything. So we were very anxious to see him. And uh, we were standing behind the portieres, and he was quite a person to see. He was very tall, sort of tall and lanky, sort of a typical New Englander, as you would imagine. He had been mo very athletic and everything, and uh, he sat down, and uh, he, I always remember that his voice was kind of like, uh, Jimmy, uh, the movie actor who, well, now I tell you. Uh, Jimmy Stewart? Jimmy Stewart, yeah. He had, his voice was kind of like Jimmy Stewart, you know. And uh, he was very interesting, and he had these very long legs, and he would sit on the couch, 
and stretch his legs out and put one foot on top of another as he, as he sat there and he would sort of make them go back and forth. And after it was over, mother, mother said to us, well, what did you think of him, kids? And my sister said, that man has the longest feet of anyone I've ever seen. <laughs> That's what she got out of it. But we found it very interesting. <clears throat> and of course, when Bob and uh, Bill got together, um, I mean, Bill and Bob, whatever you want to say, um, they were in this little room, so we couldn't uh, hear any of it when we didn't particularly want to. But after that, after they uh, got going and had this uh, little nucleus of people whom they had been able to help uh, stop drinking, then they would uh, bring people into the house. They would bring in these people that needed to be uh, dried out. So my sister and I would sit on the stairs and watch these people being brought in. And uh, as you know, uh, I'm sure, that many people, when they're drunk, they're very amusing. <clears throat> and so they'd bring these people in and they'd say the funniest things. It was really very entertaining, you know. They'd bring these people in and they'd say, oh, I don't, I don't know Henrietta, oh, and you know, laugh at each other. And, uh, but this happened quite frequently. We got used to it. And then after they had uh, managed to overcome their uh, drinking, their alcoholism, they would come over and they wouldn't be nearly as much fun when they were sober, we noticed. <laughs> but later on, when they were, you know, relaxed and had really uh, graduated into non-alcoholics, they were funny again. So uh, we were relieved that they hadn't lost their sense of humor. <laughs> so we had sort of an eye, an eye, eye sky view of everything that was happening. She thought that Bill was, uh, I mean, when they were, when this had been going for some time and there were various groups, she uh, recognized that Bill had a sort of a messianic complex. I call it that, I don't know anyone else that, but did. But he wanted to, you know, when you read, read about him, I didn't know about this then, but when you read about him in this book, when he was growing up, he had great talent in so many fields and he wanted to be the best in everything. And when he wanted to, felt that he could help uh, alcoholics overcome their uh, alcoholism, he wanted to cure every alcohol in the world. And he'd say things to mother like, you know, I've got a vision of a, a great, great crowds of people all using these methods to overcome their alcoholism, you know. And mother would always say, well, we're not thinking about the great crowds of people, Bill. We're thinking about one person at a time, you know. She'd bring him back to reality. And um, she also felt that he had, you know, he was very tall and uh, isn't used to sitting on little uh, quaint uh, colonial furniture such as we had in our house. and. Uh, Mother was always trying to get him to, you know, be able to sit in regular places and, you know, sort of fit in better. That was what I could see. She, she would tell him things. And so I used to think when she would say things to him like that, I would say, it was sort of as though she were bringing him up. But she was always bringing people up. Well, she would just, you know, if he, I mean, she would do this with us all the time. She, he would have little mannerisms. She'd say, you know, when you say this, you ought not to wave your hands around so much or things like that. And she was always doing that. And I'm sure her mother did it to her. And my brother used to get so angry about it. He'd say, mother, because we'd be right in the middle of an argument or something. And he'd say, mother, every time I try to make a point, you just, all I, I know you're just looking at my face and thinking I ought not to do, turn my lip over or raise my eyebrows or something. Because she was always, as though she were studying us, you know. I'm, I'm sure she did the same thing with Bill. And then one of the things I remember the most was when they, 
uh, when, when, when the book was written. And uh, he was so proud of that. And he told mother about the book. And he said, you know, I think we should, uh, you know, call it, uh, I forget what he called it, but he was going to sign his name. And she said, no, Bill, this is not just your book. This is everyone's book. And uh, your name should not be attached to it. It should be, the whole book should be anonymous. And she was the one that insisted on the anonymity. And that was a, a key thing to do. Because mother was very sensitive to a uh, tendency to sort of boost one's own prominence and uh, ignore the whole picture, you know. She was very, uh, a great believer in the, in the lessons of the Old, of the New Testament especially, the spiritual lessons that can be learned uh, from the Bible that would, were relevant to overcoming alcoholism. So it upset her a little bit that some of these meetings uh, seem to be turning away from a religious uh, source, you know. So, and sometimes people would come and ask her advice about it, but after a while they were, you know, all on their own. They were doing what they were doing and it was helpful. So she just, you know, kept up an in interest in it, but she didn't, she wasn't active in it. In the first place, he was a wonderful man. He, he, he was a, I think he was a student of Greek and everything, he had a lot of languages. Maybe that was partly because of his medical background, but he was a very uh, well-educated man. But he was so different from Bill because he was tall and like Bill and had sort of a long face and a very deep voice. And, uh, and he was a great, uh, lover of the Gospels. You know, he relied upon the uh, Gospels for help, you know, and for advice and, and things like that. And I think one of his, he, see, there was one, one of the Gospels, I can't remember which one, but, or one of the Old Testament where he said uh, that he was the Lord, servant of the Lord, you know, he said, Sort of, a, I'm, don't ask me, I'm just work here, you know, I'm just a servant, you know. He always thought of himself as that in a very uh, self... Um, humble. Yeah, humble way. So mm -hmm. I, I loved Bob, he was really great. Well, uh, Bill was just fascinating. I mean, he is fascinating. And... Um, when things had been going for quite some time, and when we, we all lived in, my sister and, and mother and I, uh, I, I don't know what John was doing. He was maybe in, in the war, I don't know, because I'm not sure of the time, but uh, I remember when they celebrated uh, Founder's Day, which was the day when Bill stopped drinking. And I think the day that Bill stopped drinking was actually after he had that uh, psychic experience. That, that really had a terrific effect on him. And anyway, so we, they were celebrating, they had this big meeting in New York. I happened to be in New York at that time. And so we went to it. And um, it was really wonderful because all, various alcoholics got up and uh, told a funny story or two, you know, about themselves, things that they had done and they, they, they could now laugh at. And I remember when Lois, uh, Bill's wife, was a wonderful person. And uh, she's written a wonderful book herself. And uh, I remember they had, they had some sort of a place they would go to in the summer up in, I don't know, it was Vermont or New Hampshire. But they were having a, a picnic there and they invited my sister and mother and me. And Bill was there and he was, uh, taught himself practically to play the violin, and he had now taken up the cello. And he had, I remember he had a recording of a cello concerto, and he had his cello there, and he was playing the recording and practicing the uh, cello. And, 
And I thought, this was so wonderful. Because, you know, the cello has this wonderful, deep, uh, penetrating quality. And I had the feeling that it's just what Bill needed. You know, he needed that deep musical uh, motive in his life. Mm. He was certainly a person with many, many, many aspects to his personality. Uh, my sister and I often talk about this, uh, reminisce about it, you know, the fact that, that Bill uh, had this terrible feeling that he might uh, drink again, that he came to Akron in order to get his business going again, and it all fell through, and he was on the verge of taking a drink again, and he was, had that terrible need, and um, mother was, had made these affiliations with the Oxford group and had found out about Bob's problem and was wondering how, she, how they could help Bob. As soon as she heard Bill's story over the phone, she right away thought, this is the man who could help Bob. And the very fact that she got the idea of helping him through the Oxford group method, you know. You know the alcoholics themselves, I know, sometimes if you talk about it, no matter whether, whether they're uh, true believers or uh, whatever, agnostic or whatever, they recognize there are things you can't account for. And then often all say, but by some strange uh, luck or whatever, uh, you know, they'll say, they, they always make these little um, apostrophes in the air to indicate that we really don't know. So we say, by some strange circumstance, or just by luck or something, and, and they think of, many of them think it, depending on their religion, is it God's plan that caused all this to happen? You know, there does come a time in life when you want to be part of something important, you know? And she recognized right away that uh, this was an extremely important uh, movement. And, uh, you know, after all, she had, um, it was important to her to have, the, have children and, and raise us the way we ought to be. And um, this was important too, you know. It's good to be involved in something important.